My name is Alexander Lash, and I'm here to talk about taking back your cell phone, really taking it back from the manufacturer, taking it back from the carrier, enabling features that you read on the spec sheet and then couldn't find after you bought it. But first, everyone's favorite part, the disclaimer. This talk is not an endorsement, a detailed guide about a particular phone except when it is. About carriers, okay, well, it's mostly about carriers. It's especially not approved or sanctioned by my employer in any way, and in no way represents any opinion, policy, or stance of theirs. Oh, and more disclaimers. This will probably break your phone. Please keep backups. It will break your contract if your carrier finds out. Your carrier can and will charge you. Do not use BitTorrent on a tethered link. <laughs> it's funny until you get the bill. And this does mostly target the USA cell market. Apologies for international visitors. Why I'm doing this. Here's a brief history of tethering me and Verizon. Sure, if you buy the data cable. Two hours online of customer service getting a feature added. I need to get the secret code from the manufacturer. And then finally, and this is the current story, oh, that's 60 a month, and oh, it was free on your last phone. But your new phone's hardware isn't compatible. And um, well, with the free service, anyways. And other innovations I've seen in my career here crippled Bluetooth, because headsets are good, but ringtones are bad. Scare tactics, that $20,000 cell phone bill I think most of you have heard of. Media transfer fees, because you're not allowed to put your own ringtones on. Locked application platforms, such as Brew, because everyone should have to pay $10 for Solitaire. And many, many more. And just in memoriam, all the phones that have died to produce this talk. I will pour one out after the show. <laughs> anyway, some basic skills that you'll all want to have. Dealing with your carrier. I do get this a lot more than you'd expect. Automated systems don't check for many things, like, for example, the fact that your phone wasn't purchased from the same carrier. Be very circumspect. Talk about faults in features you're already paying for. Be courteous. And above all, don't let them keep talking. Keep going on. They'll just simply cave in. Not that I said that. And again, stress that you need to make calls unless you're not paying for that. <laughs> Some great online resources. Howard Forums. I will say, them, say it as many times as I can. It is the best resource to find people like me, people better than me, people who I've stolen notes from to produce this talk. You'll find someone who's already done the same mod you're attempting and can tell you what will go wrong. XDA Developers is one of the best Windows mobile sites and covers a lot of stuff that's of general interest to smartphone users. The appropriate phone operating system SDK from Apple, from Microsoft, or the Symbian group has a lot of great examples for you to take, and some of them will, in fact, enable these features. And if you can get it, your manufacturer's SDK. Motorola has a great program for this. So starting off with feature phones. Now, what's a feature phone? Many of you have probably never heard the term. It's not a smartphone. It's your average cell phone. It's running a manufacturer's operating system. It generally runs only sandboxed apps. And yes, I know this describes the iPhone perfectly. Still, it's a smartphone. Now, it tends to be a much less expensive alternative up front. It tends to have many more locks in place, far fewer features. There tend to be special plans for it. And I guess that's why it's a feature phone. And yes, it's already time for another iPhone joke. Essentials, get a data cable. If you have a data cable, you should come to the Hardware Hacking Village after the Q&A session. We might be able to do some interesting stuff for you. Serial terminal software. There's a GSM AT command set that was finalized quite a while ago, and almost all of those commands are implemented on both CDMA and GSM-based phones and let you do, again, some fantastic stuff. Bitpim, Gamu, and Noki are all open source projects, all of which will let you open up your phone's feature phone's file system. The Qualcomm PST, which almost no one in the audience will be able to obtain, it's CDMA only, and it's not generally available to anyone but carriers, but will let you do some rather interesting tricks. The manufacturer's product support tools, available to their technical support people. Again, very useful if you're trying to do stuff, but I don't know how you'd be able to obtain something like this. And most importantly, sign up for unlimited data. For a feature phone on most carriers, this is between 7 to 15 bucks a month and gives you a wonderful excuse to be suddenly using a large number of data minutes for no apparent reason. Your grail is the manufacturer PST. This is the real bricking alert. Even when used properly, these things tend to crash. And especially when used properly, these things tend to crash and leave your phone bricked. And really, find someone else who's tried it first. 
very high risk, very high rewards. With this grail, you can get rid of the proprietary UI some carriers <coughs> Horizon currently force on you. You can sometimes change out Qualcomm Brew for J2ME to install your own apps. It's a great way to kill a week in a phone. I have a wonderful war story for this. Unlock Bluetooth profiles. Again, if you're lucky, get dial-up networking, get A2DP sometimes, and of course, file transfer for ringtones. Unlock USB mass storage mode. Use your phone as a flash drive. And flash features from newer phones or newer revisions of the same phone. Razor owners, I'm looking at you. Stupid phone tricks for everyone in the audience if you'd like to follow along. Here are a few different codes you can plug into your phone right now to access a certain menu which will let you do a variety of things. On most phones, this will let you set your own WAP proxy. Many of you are wondering what that will do, and the answer is, shortly, let you connect to the internet through your own proxy without paying for mobile web access from Verizon or a number of other carriers. Um, credit to howardforums.com for all of these. Again, can't plug them enough. Oh, and um, yeah, the iPhone has one of these too. <laughs> Just like every other fit smart phone. What can you do with this next? Okay, break your phone. Again. There, you can tweak some odd settings that you really don't want to tweak. If you don't understand what it is, look it up first. If you can't find a reference on it, really don't tweak it, or at least if you did, don't tell me you did. You can get free WAP through this, like I said, using your own HTTP proxy. This is usually called web sessions. You'll need to have an open HTTP proxy to do this, and that's a wonderful problem in and of itself. Now, this is on CDMA only, and we'll get into the reason for that in a second. Some phones will also not allow you to plug in a data cable without going into this menu and enabling the option. You can sometimes change your NAI, and I will say what that means shortly. And this is the first step towards free tethering. Now, why am I... Tethering is something I'm going to come back to a lot, and to me it's one of the most important features on a feature phone because it lets you connect to your laptop or a Nokia device, or a real PDA, get real internet access, get real mobile apps going, and that's what I do most of my research in. This is just what I have to do to get it to work. Uh, tethering is carrier authenticated, requires a valid context. There's different terms for GSM and CDMA there, and how you get a valid one, the easiest way is to buy one. Again, buy that feature phone data plan. It's very much worth it. Or you can kind of find one using a CDMA carrier issue, which we're going to get to again in a second, specifically into this second. CDMA. BitPIM is your best ally if you're on Verizon or even on Sprint. Accessing your phone's file system, it's an open source alternative to a wide variety of tools that are difficult or illegal to find or steal, tools that don't exist, and tools that are very proprietary, such as, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of G-A-G-I-N, Get Around, Get It Now. Show of hands, anybody? Nice, old school. This works on every CDMA phone since the VX4400, the first phone I killed. No coincidence there. And support gets better every day. It's an open source project. The most important thing you can do with BitPim is make a complete backup of your phone for when you break it because you will. And again, quick uses of BitPim. You can add ringtones with it instead of paying two bucks a ringtone. Add pictures instead of paying a buck to transfer it to yourself as an MMS. Add video, which most carriers don't let you do. Download video to your computer, which again, most carriers don't let you do. Back up your phone, again, the in memoriam slide. And modify system files, which let you do little tricks like turn off the shutter noise on your camera and other annoying features built into your phone. And again, howardforums.com is a great place to find out what to start breaking. Qualcomm PST is yet another breaking alert, even though this is the most important carrier tool most stores use for service programming. You can use the backup service programming, restore it to a new phone after you brick yours, modify your service programming for tethering, really only tethering, you don't want to mess with the rest of it, and it's the only really surefire way to change your network access identifier, the NAI. It can also modify some files that BitPim can't. Here's a brief history of CDMA data. She has a lot of great information for everyone. And here's another eye chart. But uh, the most important part is everything now boils down to the NAI if you have a modern phone. And by modern, I mean pretty much in the last three years, which should be everyone here. It authenticates you for data connections. You may have seen your number at vzw3g.com in various places. Now, most phones have two. One's for WAP and carrier services and unlimited access on... I honestly have no idea. I guess we've gone to DEF CON 17? <laughs> right, so uh, 
Goons, anybody? I'll just yell louder. So, most phones have two. One is for WAP and carrier services, like, for example, checking in on your account. Unlimited access on this NAI tends to be 10 a month. Unlimited access on the, oh, and of course, most non-plan access generally bills as airtime for that particular NAI. That's what lets you download applications from their app store. There's a different one for tethering, the one that you're charged 45 bucks a month to use, and non-plan access generally gets rejected. Now, what happens on your phone is, depending on whether or not you're trying to tether or whether you're using an on-phone carrier service, it will pick from one that's stored in its flash memory. And the trick is simply to use Qualcomm PST or your phone's debug menu to change this. And I was going to do a demo and was told that by no means should I possibly do a demo, thanks to my company's legal team. But um, I will be at the Hardware Hacking Village and we're happy to show some of this at the Q&A. Anyway, do we still have a... Um, Okay, this is not a real alert. This is merely a test. If there was really an alarm that needed to interrupt this talk, it would be accompanied by somebody screaming, probably me. <laughs> anyway. Thanks, I'll be here all afternoon. So getting on to GSM, which is basically the, th X yeah, there we go. We're halfway through the deck, <laughs> moving right along. GSM. For the most part, what I've said about the file system is the same. The tools you will access will be different. What makes GSM different is the fact that GSM data wasn't an accident. There's a few reasons for this. Most voice plans, therefore, have per kilobyte charges for data access, whereas on most CDMA plans, it's simply billed as airtime. GSM phones tend to be sold in freer countries than this one. Generally support J2ME out of the box, which means you can run your own applications without much trouble, and rely on carrier locks, whereas Verizon relies on device locking. It's a different system, and IMEI locks. And of course, GSM networks allowed for non-carrier approved devices from day one, whereas most CDMA networks are just now allowing this. So we're getting on to the APN which is the equivalent of the NAI but for GSM, and it authenticates you for data connections. WAP.singular may look very familiar to someone, or WAP.voicestream.net, or uh, tzones.tmobile.com. There's a large number of these. Again, most phones have two, and this will look very, very similar, except for the fact that non-plan access tends to get billed per kilobyte or get rejected entirely. Neither of these are great, and again, the way around it is to simply buy a data plan temporarily. And it's exactly like an NAI in every way, really. The carrier's just a little bit smarter about it. Good news. The APN is very rarely stored on the phone. You set it when you're establishing a connection. This means you generally do not have to reflash any part of your phone or have any real tools. You just need to know the right APN. Unlimited WAP access, therefore, becomes unlimited tethering. You're within reason, again, no BitTorrent, and uh, violates your carrier TOS, and I didn't tell you how to do it. Carrier unlocking is a real issue for GSM, which it's really hard for me to get into. It generally requires some deep firmware mods. It's usually phone specific, if not manufacturer specific. Or it requires some hardware mods, which can generalize to a wide variety of phones. And profits get made here, so it's very hard to find open information on this. I was able to put together some general tips and tricks, but it really wouldn't be of interest to most of the audience. Mostly it's for older phones. And uh, it's really outside the scope of the talk, and I could spend three hours on this. I'm not sure why that was animated. Anyway, smartphones, which I think most everyone here is carrying. Can I get a show of hands, actually, if you're carrying a smartphone? Yeah. Real surprise there. So, general smartphone notes. Different plans with the exact same back end and generally cost four times as much for data because they know you're going to use it. Supply and demand. Very rarely are you software locked or feature restricted with a smartphone. Generally because carriers are loath to go into the same amount of uh, 
effort, really. There's a lot more smartphone variation. There's a lot of market reasons for this, but it's a good thing. And really, modifications only have to touch the OS. If it works on one Windows mobile phone, it's going to work on almost all of them, unless, of course, you're relying on a, GSM, uh, excuse me, a GPS chip that simply isn't there. So first of all, the BlackBerry. All of my BlackBerry slides are here. Blackberries are very much like feature phones. They tried not to rewrite most of this. This includes with respect to tethering. The same tips and tricks apply verbatim. They generally come with fairly few locks. It's a recurring smartphone theme. Symbian generally behaves like a feature phone, including with respect to tethering. Generally comes with very few locks. And yes, it's a seriously recurring theme in smartphones. Symbian devices also tend to not get sold here, and carriers outside of the United States take very different policies. So again, Symbian phones, not a real issue to tether with. Windows Mobile devices. Your best weapon here is actually the official Windows Mobile SDK. To restore features your carrier left out, this very commonly includes the Bluetooth dial-up networking profile. If you simply take the bits from the SDK and put them on your phone, you have tethering. You can also use this to add features to your phone. For example, there is a SDK example, which is a pseudo GPS driver, which will take a variety of different pseudo GPS sources and turn them into a regular NMEA compatible GPS that can be consumed by TomTom or your particular GPS navigation solution of choice, or any of a number of different applications, really. And finally, the iPhone which looks like a smartphone, locks like a feature phone, and frankly, it's too early to tell how open it will get, and um, also, I'm kind of a fan. The most important thing about the iPhone, which I hope everyone's heard about, is the jailbreak. I'm actually currently re-jailbreaking my phone during this talk, which is why it's plugged in. Run, again, run your own community apps. There's no Apple oversight or restrictions, and there's no documentation whatsoever. Working on that. Carrier unlock on the iPhone has been established well for the 2G iPhone. Still being researched for the 3G iPhone. Some of it sounds very promising, but nothing is out there yet. And uh, there's, of course, one smartphone platform I guess I'm overlooking. There's actually a few. Android. And I wanted to have some stuff about Android, but really there's no hardware. There's nothing interesting for me to talk about yet. It's a very interesting concept as far as taking back your own cell phone is because you're going to have full access to a variety of things that traditionally neither the manufacturer nor the carrier ever wanted you to touch. And in some ways that's a good thing, in some ways that's a terrible thing. Uh, Google's rollout of the SDK has also been very interesting if you've been following that. And I really look forward to seeing what impact, if any, it's going to make. And resources here. Again, howardforums.com. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, Howard Forums, XDA developers, the iPhone dev team, and the official SDK examples are all some fantastic places to find out all the stuff that I've been talking about today, get the actual details. And I'd like to say thanks to a few people, all of whom are actually in the audience. I'd like to thank Abend, who's uh, sitting there and hiding with long hair, or he just couldn't find a seat. Shardy and Dave G, who gave me the initial idea to give this talk. I'd like to thank Totenkopf, who's presenting on Sunday, and you should all go. And you all should have gone to Ferdinand's talk, which was two hours ago. And I missed it because I was putting together this slide deck. And uh, my friend Max Falco, who doesn't know it, but he is going to be presenting next year, whether he likes it or not. And uh, yeah, this is the first time anyone told him. Now, you might think, wow, he ran through a shit ton of slides really quickly. And the answer is, yes, I did. And the answer is, the most interesting part of this is the Q&A. Because you all have specific phones, or you have Motorola questions, or Nokia questions, many of which I hope to be able to answer right now for you. All this is great general information, but really everyone wants to know what they can do with their phone. Same thing I did at Torcon. People liked it, and I'd like to now open the floor for questions. You, sir. So the question here is, is there any way to develop your own brew applications for your own brew-enabled cell phone for free? 
And the answer is unfortunately not anymore. There used to be a way to get around it with Brew V1, but we're now on to V3 with most phones. It is possible to get a copy of the SDK, and it is possible to start writing your own applications, but unfortunately doing so requires a few hundred dollars worth of certificates. There is no free or open way to develop for Brew, and that's one of the many reasons why I try and remove it on any device I own. Question. The question here is how long do we expect it to be for the, until there will be true flash, as in a flash virtual machine and player on the iPhone, and what's currently stopping? Well, the answer to what's currently stopping it really is Apple more than anything else. I understand from Adobe they've put together prototypes, and there's a wide variety of devices that run similar operating systems, like um, the Nokia 770, 800, and 810 all have flash players. And really, Apple wants to ensure a certain experience with the iPhone, and frankly, most flash apps would run very poorly on it, leading to crashes and hangs and other things that Apple is very zealously against. And I think that, more than anything else, is why we don't see it right now. Adobe certainly would love to have it on every iPhone. I mean, no question. Speaking of questions. You always, oh, sorry. sorry. You always hear about people who get caught using tethering without a tethering plan, and what sort of triggers will set that off? Every carrier has a built-in limit to their feature phone's unlimited plan. In general, this is about five gigabytes. Uh, I know that is that for Verizon. Some international carriers go down to one or two. Uh, Rogers, for example, is one gigabyte. And really what will get you caught is going over that limit. Almost nothing else will. BitTorrent will also get you caught for going over that limit because you're going to have upload and download that looks much more symmetric than it should be. Using a large number of encrypted services, again, most of which don't run on phones, can be a red flag. But for the most part, you're a needle in a haystack if you're not doing anything that goes over that five gig limit. Question back there. For the longest time, you had to use Motorola PST to put the phone into suspend mode. Is there a way to do that with freeware tools? Now, it is possible to suspend a Motorola phone by holding down star and hash as you boot it up. That will put it into a bootloader mode. I think you're talking about P2K mode. P2K mode is what lets you... Okay. P2K mode is on a Motorola phone and has been for the longest time. It lets you access almost everything on the phone, reflash settings, reflash the firmware. And Motorola actually has released a freeware application called Motorola Software Updater, which, when used properly or just used period, will put the phone in P2K mode, at which point you can turn and use apps like P2K Commander to browse the full phone file system or um, P2K Flex to reflex the uh, settings in the firmware. Is it possible to do that from Linux? And the answer is not really. I got it working with Wine once. But it's, you can do it through a VMware player virtual machine with the proper connections. Easiest. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you back there. Gotcha. Apparently, Motorola has released a program, if I'm hearing you correctly, called Motorola, Moto 4 Linux, available in Gen 2 already, which uh, can do P2K sub actions on Linux, it sounds like. Excellent. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Can you come up here? Linux on the smartphone? Um, you mean like the Limo Collective and so forth? Again, without having hardware in my hands I've been able to break and play with, and if that a community, I don't have a lot of information on that. I'd expect it to work the same way that Android's going to work insofar as with this much deep access into the kernel, into the SDK, into things that previously you weren't able to touch or couldn't touch without expensive tools, we're going to see some very interesting applications in very, very open phones. What about actual hacks to put Linux on phones? 
I'm not aware of any that are really usable. That is, I mean, my criteria is if I can't use it as a phone afterwards, I can't really install Linux on it. The trio. There's apparently a trio distribution. Yeah, if it works as a phone, I haven't heard of it personally, but that'd be great. And question. Uh, before you do anything to your phone, how do you back up your phone? And the answer is, I mean, before you start writing things back to the phone, make a backup. Tools like BitPim are entirely safe to use if your phone's on the supported list. If it's on the supported list, it's actually been physically tested and tested fairly rigorously. And really, for read operations, you're not going to have any trouble. It's when you start reflashing your phone that you're going to kill a memory controller and have to have a very awkward conversation with Verizon technical support. <laughs> Question. Couldn't hear you at all. I'm sorry. What is the most interesting thing I've seen done on a Windows mobile smartphone? Quantify interesting. I've seen a browser on a Windows mobile smartphone that doesn't suck. That was the most interesting thing I've seen on a Windows mobile smartphone. Which browser was that? Can't tell you. Sorry, I suck, I know. You've heard of it, possibly. This is a great question. Um, the question is, all these modifications, can they be done without noting the MSL, master sub lock, of your phone? And the answer is, a great deal of them can be. Most of the PST stuff couldn't care less about your MSL. And in the event that you do have an MSL in your way, uh, for ex most phones have it set to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, or if you've heard space balls, 1, 2, 3, 4, Five six. <laughs> that covers ninety percent. Actually, it's pretty funny. Uh, Sprint has a policy of changing the MSL, and if you call Sprint and inform them you're a developer, not only will they tend to give you developer access to your phone, which includes being able to add your own root certificates. I could get into J2ME development if you'd like at the Hardware Village, but also that MS they'll give you the MSL if you ask. The process for Sprint has now been improved to the point where it's entirely automated, done all through the web, and requires no interaction with a human being. Just requires a little bit of swapping. This man would be a good one to talk to about Sprint. I can see. Questions? I know that the removal of IPv6 from the iPhone is a very, very, there's a lot of people ticked off about that. Um, there's a lot of people ticked off about, as far back as 112, they removed some hooks that were looking like we'd be able to put our own kernel extensions on the iPhone. I know there's a lot of people, myself included, who are working furiously on that. Mostly people more qualified than me to modify a kernel on a system I've never ever used before, but still, I know people are working on that actively. Shardy. Shardy would like to know how to make free phone calls. And because I knew he would ask this question, I'd like everyone who has a spare moment to go to tinyurl.com slash S-H-A-R-D-Y. That's right, tinyurl.com slash Shardy. Question. Enterprise policies in the BlackBerry and how that can help or hurt you? So enterprise policies in the BlackBerry, I have not seen a lot of them actually put in place. I've only heard of a few companies that have gone through with them. And there's not, again, there's not a lot of community information out there about it. I haven't heard of one that prevents tethering. 
Um, application install, you can circumvent with the proper PST, uh, especially if you're on CDMA, Quilk wouldn't be a huge deal. But beyond that, I don't know what to tell you. Just, again, I'm limited to what I can get out of the community if I can't get the hardware myself. And questions? Oh, yeah, totally. Sorry, I've been neglecting that side. I'm sorry, I can't hear over you the speaker back behind me. Ooh, for getting GP, so you'd like to be able to use the GPS in your Verizon BlackBerry without dealing with Verizon's uh, per own expensive GPS navigation system. I know of a couple projects that have started on that. They had some progress and then stopped. I'm sorry. Problem with the community. <laughs> The Open Moco project, again, I kind of file into the open smartphones. It's really cool. I got to see one of the devices, and it's an open device. You can do whatever you want with it. It's an open device that's expensive and has some hardware limitations, and whether or not your carrier will ever let you activate it is another question. But again, until they start getting them into people's hands, it's really cool, but beyond that, don't know what to tell you. Way in the back. I'm going to need a bucket brigade of people yelling, unfortunately. So editing the registry on your Windows mobile device in order to enable tethering. Uh, modern Windows mobile devices do it through a different mechanism. There's a separate app that you have to run. Um, that's like Windows Mobile 5 and 6 to be specific. I'm sorry? Yes. As far as I know, there's no registry hack to enable it. You just need to have the executable on your phone. And it was removed in Windows Mobile 5 AKU3 and then redistributed as part of the SDK, which is the best place, again, best place to find it. And XDA developers will have that able for down, or available. They'll be able to tell you where to find it. I'll put it that way. Question. Updating X60 devices without sending it into Nokia for updates, the firmware. I had heard Nokia's got their, they've updated their software updater to allow that. On the older one, the older ones I can't help you with. I think, unfortunately, you're stuck sending it in. Yeah, Nokia kind of phased out support for the early devices fairly rapidly. And I'm really curious to see what happens now that Symbian's open source, given the number of people who don't update their devices, can't update their devices, have never heard of the Nokia software updater. And you know we're going to find exploits in it. We're good at that as a community. Question. Palm, yeah, th those from Windows Mobile, right? So on the original Palm Trios, for the most part, Palm, I, say what? Yeah, Palm OS based Palm Trios. From what I, uh, for the most part, I wasn't aware they locked down too much on those. I know that tethering, again, is just an installable app, and that's all there is to it. Uh, if you go to Howard Forums, they're going to have a forum for your specific model, and it will have how to do that. Best recommendation I can give you. Question. What company do I work for? Microsoft. See, I was worried about a lynch mob, but... So S60 question. Uh, S60 is the one platform I know worse than anything else, worse than Palm. Oh, okay. So do you want to actually tell, say that? Okay. Uh, 
when Symbian goes open source, that's gonna not going to up, uh, affect updates from Nokia. But Nokia have a policy of ceasing updates after a year or two years. And open source Symbian isn't going to give you the drivers and the various add-ons that Nokia add for a particular older device. You're not going to make new ROMs. Rep from Simeon, right in the front. How likely is it is your company's BlackBerry Enterprise service going to notice if you unlock everything? Um, based on a number of other enterprise systems that's supposed to lock this down, the chances are between zero and not. I've never heard of anyone ever, except the fact of walking up to the head of IT and saying, hey, look, my pin lock's disabled actually getting caught for that. Very, very popular unlock. Right in the front again, because. Firewalls actually running on the handsets themselves. I'm actually not aware of any really serious enterprise class firewall offerings for any phone yeah, on a handset. Wait, do you mean VPN clients or do you mean firewalls? Anyway, does, does he get your? Yeah. I mean, I would love to have a firewall on my phone personally, but I know for a fact on the iPhone they've disabled uh, IPFW and no one's cracked kernel extensions quite yet. Big project, though. Question. Any chance of A2DP, uh, Advanced Audio Distribution Profile, getting anywhere on the iPhone? I really hope so. I have some nice Bluetooth headphones. I'd like to use them. The reason why not is because as far as I'm aware, there's nothing on the iPhone that's particularly good at decoding A2DP or, in, or excuse me, decoding or encoding SBC subband codec. And as a result, you're going to see dramatically shortened battery life. I mean, I was working on a project for the Nokia Internet Tablet Devices. They run Linux to get that working. And until we were able to get it onto a DSP chip, which the iPhone simply doesn't have, the battery trade-off and CPU trade-off was just unacceptable. Uh, you couldn't even really encode MP3s and real, excuse me, decode music in real time or video and listen to it over a Bluetooth link. And I think you're going to have to stick with a dongle for the time being. Question. Encrypt the contents of the iPhone, as in the partitions on it and so forth, or the data is stored in the applications? What level of encryption? So there are some, if you jailbreak your iPhone, you can install GNU PG and encrypt and decrypt whatever you'd like. I'm not aware of any iPhone applications that support transparent encryption of the kind it sounds. I mean, you would have to manually encrypt and decrypt when you used and stopped using the application. I'd be very, very surprised if that remains the case as iPhone development matures. And of course, there's remote wipe. And it's 140. Ooh, if you set the IMEI, if you... If you clone a phone, basically, if you clone all of the settings on a phone, what happens? And the answer is it depends on the network, and it's a really terrible idea. Because for the, you're going to get cell registration. You're going to, you might get, you, you won't get calls on both phones. One phone will be able to answer it is what's going to happen. And what will happen when the carrier systems start detecting duplicates? might get very weird. I, I don't know of anyone who's tried to do that except for nefarious purposes, so. I'm curious too, but they don't really publish much. So what? Security through obscurity, exactly. Question.
I actually know of a tool that can pull the A key off of a variety of CDMA phones. Not that I'd mention it by name. Um, but yes, cloning doesn't really work. And even if you were able to perfectly clone a phone, the system wouldn't accept it. It would pick you up fairly quickly. And again, there are some mobile firewalls out there. And what I'm hearing is that they're not terribly useful yet. Yeah. So you just better hope that your phone is entirely proof against any attack with any sort of firewall of any kind. Trust your vendor. Ugh. Is there a way to get Nokia feature phones to stop asking you to allow certain features to be used? Like, for example, um, being able to access the internet or accessing location information. And I can't speak to all Nokia feature phones, but almost every J2ME um, virtual machine has separate settings for signed and unsigned applications. Generally, signed applications, you're allowed to set certain features as always allow. Unsigned, you're not. What's funny is that with full file system access, you can generally find the file that says these rules and modify it so that unsigned is allowed to set to always allow would be my recommendation there. But there's nothing direct, there's nothing you can do easily on the phone immediately. And getting a signature in there can be more or less difficult depending on your carrier and particular phone. Question. Can't hear you at all. Have I heard of anyone getting Bluetooth tethering working on Samsung's Instinct? I have not heard of that yet. I would say Howard Forums probably already has a detailed how-to with screenshots. It's kind of what they do. Um, Instinct, again, too new for me to have really covered it here. And I only really cover the iPhone because I own one and can break it whenever I feel like it, which is frequently, actually. Question. I'm sorry, like what mode? Monitor mode on a Wi-Fi enabled smartphone. Um, I would really expect you gotta wait for a Linux or Android based device. I've never heard of anyone getting monitor mode to work stably or successfully with a Windows mobile based phone. Haven't heard of it on the iPhone and I don't know enough about Simeon to tell you. I would expect no, just generally because getting that feed, Adding that support to the driver takes effort, and if there's no need for it. I'm sorry? Can't get to the radio on Symbian phones is what I'm hearing. So, no. Pretty definitively. Not yet. I hope so soon. Is there a reason why carriers like to lock down the installation of new certificate authorities on their mobile phones? Oh, God, yes. And the answer is money. Because if they're the only ones who can certify applications for your phone, they are the only ones who can provide that certificate that actually lets you get through and use apps without clicking, yes, I'd like to allow it to access the Internet, or yes, use my location information. It is purely a profit driver. Generally, the installation of certificate authorities, once you have full file system access, tends to not be too difficult in my experience. Your mileage may vary. I haven't done it on a large number of phones, mostly Motorola phones. Just verifying that it's not the manufacturer. It's especially not Symbian doing this. It is the carriers. And again, they're the ones who are realizing profit flow from this. In the case of Apple, it's much more complicated, but we can kind of follow that from the App Store. There's a lot of motivations for Apple to never release any kind of signing key. Thank you, Jailbreak. Oh, yeah. Uh, SSH clients on feature phones. 
mid P S S H. Um, very mature, very stable. Use it all the time. Got a lot of great features. I mean, again, you're still using SSH on a phone. It's never going to be a very pleasant experience. But I was able to set up macros and use Pine perfectly. Um, mid P S S H. Good stuff. Runs wherever J2ME is available. Runs on Blackberries. Runs on Windows Mobile. Runs on. You have a question in the back. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is there any significance to the iPhone test mode code being one character off of Nokia's? I, I'm sorry, I can't. I still can't hear you, but if I got the initial question right, yes, kind of. All right. I don't have a tinfoil hat, so I can't tell you. I think it's pretty funny, though. But, I mean, Motorola's is pound zero setup star. I wouldn't be surprised to see that duplicated. Question, the, or actually, question the back. You got one. Using the phone to send and receive faxes, yes, you can do it. Um, yeah, um, if you are sending or receiving faxes, you're using, well, again, I'm speaking to um, CDMA here. I don't know enough about GSM for that one. That one I can't field for you. On Verizon, or excuse me, on CDMA networks, that does go over basically analog, basically over 2G and works as an analog. You basically use it as an analog fax modem with the right software. Question, oh, last one. Any thoughts on NFC? I, I'm not recognizing the acronym off the top of my head. Oh, near field communications. I really expect it to not take off. I, would, I think there's a lot of really interesting applications for it and a lot of cool stuff. But as far as the U.S. cell market and the way we tend to lag behind, I don't know what to tell you. In Japan, out of the country, yes. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to take any remaining questions at the Q&A. Uh, yeah, the Q&A is across the hall in 106. Oh, and one last plug. The Q&A will be across the hall in 106. And if you were looking for the IDA Pro Book and, like me, missed the initial rush and didn't get one, the EFF will be auctioning one in their room tomorrow at 2 p.m.